collegiate learning assessment uh, is, this, is this tool originally for assessing uh, students' skills development in critical thinking, in problem solving, and in writing. And they approach these tasks holistically. There's actually three parts to the CLA, but we're only interested in one part. There's make an argument, critique an argument, and then there's what are called performance tasks. The performance tasks are somewhat similar to case studies. What you have are a set of documents that are provided to the student. And the documents um, are not going to be the best documents available. They're deliberately designed to include a mixture of relevant, irrelevant, misleading, um, sometimes structured to, to take the students off task, information. And the students actually have to sift through the documents, compare them against each other, see which ones need to be favored. Some of the documents are going to contain unreliable information. <coughs> um, some of them will contain fallacies. Some of the documents will also contain arguments that the students have to identify and look at. So you have a document library that can range anywhere from two to you know, eight or nine documents. And the documents are going to contain data of different types. So some of it may be quantitative and some of it may be qualitative. You give them the students uh, sometimes just to wean them away from over-reliance on you know, qualitative anecdotal information as opposed to actual you know, statistics. So the documents themselves are, are one basis. Then you have a scenario. In the scenario, you have to take a role. That's why it's similar to what John was describing with problem-based learning. You are placed in some sort of position. You have to make some sort of policy decision. It could be adapted very easily for educational leadership or how did, uh, instructional, uh, instructional leadership. Yeah, I, I have to ask later on what, what the difference between those two is. See. <laughs> so um, the, the CLA, you can use it with almost any scenario. I've actually helped instructors develop them for art classes. That, that took a lot of stretching. The scenario sets the student in a situation where they have to make a decision. Usually it's in response to some other people's advocacy of this policy or that policy. So they're evaluating other people's arguments. They're evaluating other people's use of the information that's being provided them. And we try to build in things, um, again, to, to offer the students opportunities to identify what people are using incorrectly. The other thing that the students have to do, they're given these prompts. So you have documents, scenario, now you have the actual questions that they're being asked. And the questions require them to write essay responses. And the essay responses ideally are not just going to include, yes, this person's right, this person's wrong. They're going to include justifications that refer to the, the documents. So the stress is on moving away from opinion-based uh, argument to evidentiary based argumentation. And the CLA is one technique or one tool for doing this. The other component of the CLA, which the students don't usually see when it's being used solely for assessment, but which they do see if we're using it for, um, for pedagogy, is the rubric. And the CLA rubrics, they have changed over time. Uh, the one that Juan was working with is, is an older rubric from one of our performance task academies that we were given uh, a while back. This is a somewhat different presentation than you're probably coming in for. Our colleague, uh, David Gray, did show up, so I'm giving sort of an impromptu discussion of the collegiate learning assessment. Um, the rubrics evaluate certain skill areas. They break it down into um, uh, three different sort of blocks emerging, developing, and mastering, and there are subdivisions within each of those. The newer rubrics actually have scores from one to six, and each one is, is very clearly differentiated. The CLA people put a lot of work into rubric construction. And these are very usable. Juan has adopted them in, in her classes. Um, they have a generic rubric, and then you can put task or discipline specific outcomes that you're looking for from the students into the matrix of that generic rubric. So that's what a CLA performance task is. So you give it to your students, they sit down, they go through the documents, you may have them writing it out by hand, you may have them uh, doing it at a computer. Uh, sometimes I use them as take-home assignments. Um, 
ultimately what they're doing is they're generating responses that have to be well written, so they put into effect writing skills, they have to exercise their critical thinking skills both analyzing other people's arguments, finding you know, whatever flaws there may be, handling information, and also making their own arguments. And they have to do the broader skill of problem solving. They have to actually say, this policy is the better policy, and here's why. And some of the situations may actually be set up in such a way that they shouldn't actually say that one policy is better than the other. If that's the case, they should say why, why they can't make a decision. Um, one part of the rubric actually has them looking to see whether there's anything that's been left out. So that's part of the problem solving uh, matrix. Um, actually, you know, I, since we don't have a lot of people uh, used to the CLA, if you want to provide, if you've got some background, I can provide you with this uh, slideshow. Um, do you have any questions about that approach and how it ties in with what Juan was talking about with problem based learning? It, it's a very adaptable um, methodology. It take, there is a learning curve with it. There, there's quite a bit involved with it. Um, the official CLA people run these CLA performance task academies, but those are sort of just touching the tip of the iceberg, and then you have to invest quite a bit in, in um, actually applying them to classes. You learn a lot of it on the job, so to speak. Um, maybe I will use a little bit of this then. So at, at FSU, we've been using the, uh, the CLA. We started working with it in 2005, and the reason that we did, this is when the CLA was still fairly new, we did a review of our core curriculum, and we decided that the CLA would be a good tool. We didn't really know what we were getting into at the time, um, but one of the things that we liked about it was this value-added focus. Uh, all of you are familiar with the need to justify what we're doing to external agencies, to citizens, to, to the government show them that we're actually adding some, some value. So what were we going to try to add value? Well, in these, these key skills, critical thinking, decision making, and writing, and why those? Well, quite frankly, those are the ones that employers are asking for the most. And those are the ones that they're asking for precisely because most of our graduates don't have them. So the CLA um, could be useful for that. We participated in a, um, a study, and we administered them to um, our entering freshmen and then later on tested those cohorts. And our, the first time that we did it, this, from 2005 to 2007, the official results, there are a lot of results, but this is just sort of the, you know, the most easily ex explicable ones. What they showed is that our students were making some improvements, so they were at you know, the, the, the rate that we wanted them to. But that means that, um, I'm going to put on the next slide, it means that our students are being left behind because our students started out behind. So if they were already beginning the race, you know, several steps behind some of the, the, the other people who they were going to compete with in the marketplace, if we just did what we were doing, they were going to be at a disadvantage. So what we did is we brought in the CLA in the classroom. And we started a lot of initiatives. Um, we were a pilot site for the CLA in the classroom. Uh, we did some more assessment with these longitudinal studies. Um, but what's uh, more interesting, I mean, what this shows is that after we sank the resources, the time, the effort, the thought into faculty development with the CLA and infusing it into our classes, the sort of project that Juan Ma was detailing earlier, we had different results. Uh, again, this is not measuring just where our graduates were, it was measuring their rate of improvement. So their rate of improvement was well above what was expected. So putting all this effort into CLA faculty development had paid off in pretty remarkable increases in critical thinking, um, writing, and problem solving skills for our graduates. So they're starting out behind, now they actually have a chance to play on a more level playing field when they get out of the workplace. Um, this is what we did. In fall 2008, we launched a lot of different faculty development efforts aimed at the use of CLA in the classroom. We brought in the CLA people to do the workshops. Um, we had support from the Carnegie 
uh, incorporation. 99 uh, faculty participated in the first workshop. 36 of them went on to develop CLA in the classroom assessments. Uh, John Ma was one of them. I, I'm one of them. Uh, we had people from all different fields. And so we were the, you might say, the vanguard. And we've got those reports available in our digital commons. Um, we produced a CLA work group, which is still active. And the CLA work group is tasked with trying to figure out exactly how we're going to infuse the CLA into our curriculum and to produce bias. Academic units started to adopt the CLA. We're both from the department that has actually done the most with it. Um, I'm from the unit that's done the most with it, philosophy, because we teach a critical thinking class. So we actually uh, adopted the CLA for our SACS assessment as one of our uh, measures. Um, what is your QEP? Our QEP right now, the one we're developing, is focused on critical thinking. And exactly where it's going to go is uh, uh, a little bit hazy. It's clear that the CLA is going to be a major part of it, um, but we're at the stage, quite frankly, where people are throwing a lot of different things on the table, and I'm not clear myself about it. I, you know, I'm at a fairly low level of decision making when it comes to those sort of things, so I don't know what they're, what they're going to decide. All I know is that we're focused on critical thinking. We we just decided that the outcome that we want to focus on is critical thinking as demonstrated in the major disciplines. Not just uh, as a, a core element, but actually in the major disciplines. So that's why we, we picked the CLA as central. Um, government and history, we have five different disciplines at FSU. Political science, philosophy, history, geography, and intelligence studies. And we've actually put the um, CLA measures into our operational plan. Boss is very interested in. University College, which does all the in processing of our freshmen and handles the, the core assessment, they have also used the CLA pretty extensively. Uh, and then a lot of individual faculty in other departments have used the, the CLA. So some people in English have used it, but the English department is not yet committed to, to doing anything with it. It's just individual faculty. Yeah. Have you done any analysis between their data and your data in University College? And well, I've actually been the coordinator of the rising junior and entering freshman CLA exams, but that only tells us about the, these cohorts. Um, it's difficult to compare the performance tasks directly against each other where we currently are because um, you know, the, 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 the official CLA, it's the same pool of graders, and they all are, are at a high level of competency with Creating the CLA. Um, quite frankly, we're building from the ground, the ground up with that. So we have some graders who are very good, and we have some who, you know, I look at their, their, their data and I say, they're yeah, I, I don't know. You know. Um, so I can compare myself, I would feel comfortable comparing my results from my classes with, with those from other people who, as graders I know, are, are on track. And then there's some other people where, yeah, I don't know, I don't know what they're going to do. But, but institutionally what we're doing is we have the entering freshmen provide us a baseline. Now they're doing terrible as entering freshmen in critical thinking skills. Um, rising juniors, um, we've had some trouble with compliance, getting people to actually do it because we made it a voluntary test, but now it's going to be indexed to getting to go into a major. So we'll be a lot more and then uh, exiting seniors in the majors. Um, we're, we haven't started testing them with that because each discipline is going to have to develop CLA tasks and figure out how they want to implement it. That's part of the QEP. Um, so what that means is we will have it pretty soon uh, because we're, you know, the clock is ticking. We're, you know, the clock is ticking. What is your date time? What's that? What is your date? We have to have first draft written, I think by the end of December. With the SACS review, right? It starts in, I think, in April. So, you know, this has been in development for a while. Um, I haven't been involved myself in most of it through the planning stages. I got brought in because I had a lot of experience with the CLA. Um, so we've already incorporated CLA and assessments already in place. 
Audrey Muhammad was with uh, Dean Swetford, did parts of their presentations with this. Um, here's how we use it for assessment of this. We, we have these exams that test cohorts. Now, we're leaving some students out, of course, right? That transfer students, we don't test those. So we don't know how they're doing. Um, we, we do individual assessment classes, but that doesn't give us that much. The rising junior exam, that was the first one we converted into a COA. In the past, we used C-base, you know, standardized test. And we, we didn't get any useful data from it. Nobody actually used it for trying to improve classroom instruction. We uh, switched to the rising jun junior exam being a CLA, and we did it in two different tracks. We have some take the national CLA, and we use those to compare against those who took the national CLA as a freshman. And then we actually developed our own institutional CLA, and we developed a new one each year. We develop a performance task, uh, faculty administer it, grade it. And there are some, as far as I'm concerned, there's some, some questions about the reliability of the grading.
and uh, the CLA is an important one for the writing uh, and, and the critical thinking. So this is, um, again, the way our, our provost thinks of it, and so you know, he's my boss, so I think of it the same way, right? So um, when I did the webinar, you know, we had to put in all the acknowledgments, and it's kind of good to think about that. Carnegie Corporation helped us out a lot with it. Uh, and the CLA in the classroom accounts for the education did too, but then a lot of it was internal. Uh, if you want to use the CLA in a meaningful way in your university, in the classroom, you have to have the faculty development people involved, you have to have the, you know, uh, your chief academic officer like the provost buying into it. Um, and you also need entities that will say, hey, we're going to work with this. Again, there, there is a learning curve to it. And you make, you make mistakes with it. If you look at those reports that we have in our digital commons, they're very uneven. Some, some of the people clearly understood what they're working with. Some of them, it's a little bit hazier. If you were to do that, if we were to generate new reports now, you would see a, a dramatic difference in our faculty from where they were in 2008 to where they are now in the Go ahead. You have two centers, there, one for innovation and digital ah, learning. Yeah, that's part of our institutional history. Um, we used to have a center for innovation and teaching and learning. That was closed by uh, the, uh, the general administration because we were in budget cuts and so they just started cutting the centers here and there. And so what we did is we took what resources were left after it was gutted and we created an office of faculty development that has to carry on exactly the same tasks with somewhat less resources. But we're, you know, we're doing pretty good, I think, um, in, in doing faculty development. There's, there's a lot going on in this um, We don't have the title of the center anymore. We don't have a vice chancellor in charge of it anymore. Uh, but things, things are getting done. So, yeah. What time do we have to be what over about the, the issues of uh, reliability and validity? Now, that's, a, that's admittedly a big issue. We have the national CLA to provide us one marker that we can, but that's looking at the rate of improvement of our students. It's not giving us a snapshot of where our students are at any given time the way that our institutional CLA is. My, personally, I think that we do have problems with reliability, and those problems stem from faculty who don't have enough experience with the CLA and the rubrics doing the grading. Um, one of the things I'm trying to do about that this semester is actually I put together a workshop that I'll be giving in a few weeks specifically on the rubrics and grading for our faculty. But, you know, you know that sort of thing. Who goes to those workshops? It's the faculty who are already very committed. So the, the, the faculty who are less committed, less interested, they're still going to be grading erratically. So, you know. Do they get compensated? It depends. For the rising junior and entering freshman, what we've done so far is we had stipends. The participating faculty member has got 200 bucks. As a coordinator, I got 400 bucks. And we didn't put together, what I think we should have done is put in place performance measures that had to be met before you get paid anything. But we didn't. So some people did an awful lot of work, and some people did very little work. And some people did, did reliable grading, and some people did, quite frankly, fairly unreliable grading. But, you know, we have to work with what we got. It's better than having nothing. Yeah, you always pay the <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know how it is. You, you want to get things done on Title III's timeline. So time and effort reports need to be in by a certain point. And so the, for the entering freshman, that makes it difficult because we have to get all of that done you know, as, as the Title III years just come to a close. Uh, for the rising junior, it's not as big of a problem. And in my rising junior report, I made some, some recommendations about how to institutionalize some things that should lead to, to greater reliability. Personally, I, I think that if, if those things were put in place at other schools, then you would have some, some good measure of reliability. Um, 
and it, you know the strategy of using official, you might say, and institutional CLAs side by side, I think helps as well. But this, you know, they cost money too. It costs a lot less money to produce your own uh, than it does to bring the official. Yeah, since you people are preparing for SACS, and yeah. since you are still in a very shaky foundational process, don't you all think it would be better now to go to a system that would prepare you for SACS when SACS comes? Well, there's it's not shaky, um, and any rubric out there, something has to learn how to create. So whether you're using you know, AACU rubrics, faculty can be just as bad grading with those and, and do things at the last because they can't do those. I think it's a matter of having some sort of things in place to make sure faculty are being reviewed when they're doing it to the prompt speed on it. So. Yeah. Luckily, I don't have to make a lot of these decisions. Oh, and by the way, my views on the reliability of our grading process do not represent the views um, of any of our administration. <laughs> yes, they're solely my own. So, especially since they're being taped. <laughs> I got evidence. <laughs> That's going to be worth some money. I might not put that one on the website. <laughs> any, any other questions? And anybody who's interested in, in the CLA, if you want, I can give you my card. I can provide you more information to steer you towards people who, who work with this full time, uh, just from the sideline. Well, thanks for uh, your. Let's spell your, your last name again, please. Oh, Sadler, S A D L E R. S A D L E R. First name?